Space News at 5 p.m. Then workers. Just over to the gaming category. I still don't understand why Starliner. So Shax, this is over in the YouTube chat. I still don't understand why Starliner was used as wasn't used as a cargo vehicle for five plus missions before getting a human rating. Think of all of the kink SpaceX was able to work out before they moved on to crew. You have to have a metered approach, dude. Shax, that's been my criticism of pretty much everything, but. Everything, every NASA endeavor that has to do with human spaceflight, but Dragon. Uh, yeah, it, that's that's been my criticism. I don't think the testing regimes are ro were robust enough for Starliner. They really weren't. I mean, look at the Orion testing regime. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to call into doubt or cast shade like for Lockheed's engineering, but also at the same time, the infrequency of flight is... For Orion, if it, let me explain. The infrequency of flight for Orion could cause real problems down the road. You can really screw up your mission timeline if something goes wrong, right? Orion has had two test flights. Three if you include the uh, Orion Ascent Abort mission. So we had EFD-1, which tested the heat shield from coming back from MEO, right? Medium Earth orbit. And then we had... Uh, the Orion abort mission, which tested the launch the launch abort system, right? And then we had Artemis 1, which basically was kind of an end-to-end -end test minus life support. The EFT-1 Orion basically was a, a bare-bones capsule with a heat shield. The Orion Ascent abort capsule wasn't even a capsule. It was a boilerplate. The launch escape the launch abort system was real. There was no capsule or service module in there. It was just a it was just a weight a, a load simulator approximation. They didn't even recover it. And then Artemis one, they went to launch it, and that didn't have life support on board, right? And this is over the span of like four years here, right? Now, or not four years. This is over the span of ten years, right? So. Here's the thing. They ended up delaying the Artemis 2 mission by a year because the, the life support systems did not pass acceptance testing. They passed acceptance, acceptance testing that basically they work for Artemis 2, but not Artemis 3. Artemis 3, which is the mission that the capsule was designed for. Like, I'm not trying to be a jerk, and I, I know people that work on the Orion capsule. I'm not trying to be mean to them. I don't think it's the, I don't think this is an engineering problem. I think the engineers are well-versed in this, but some kind of crazy copium about saving money with human spaceflight that, you know, everybody seems to huff nowadays except for SpaceX, right? Like, and ironically, they're the ones that are actually saving money. Weird. Uh, that's not robust enough. That's not robust enough to put somebody on. Not even the Apollo missions had a testing regime like that. They were planning on putting people on Orion on its second flight into space. Like I said, I'll say this once, I'll say it again. Not even Apollo did that. And Apollo was pretty ballsy. Like, do we actually think we're good enough to do that? Well, clearly not, because life support systems failed acceptance testing for baseline every mission post Artemis 3. So that's a huge problem. And that's what I mean. The lack of robustness in your testing is if there if you run into a uh, a little funny, which you inevitably will, you're screwing up the mission timeline by years at this point, this far into development. I've been over it many times. The more funnies you have when you get closer to operational capacity, the, the more it's going to cost. Costs grow exponentially as you get closer to your operational phase of mission. Like, Starliner has a bad problem. How did you get this close to operational status and not understand your thrusters are overheating? We found several papers on NTRS after maybe a five-minute technical report search that this problem can happen with poppets. Is the problem that you're experiencing similar to this? 
is it not similar to this? Like, it's a, I think it's a fair question to ask. I don't know what port you're trying to make, Yard, but all right. I think you're vastly underestimating how much it takes the human rate of a spaceship, but whatever. All good. Yeah, they, well, that's what I mean, Hellfish. This kind of, you know, oh, yeah, we'll do it on the first try. Like, okay. I guess. They haven't done one mission with an Orion capsule with functioning life support. No. And Lazarus, they're somehow surprised that they've run into life support problems this far into development. Like, I don't understand how, like, you've had 10 years to figure this out. What? What? Dude, I could figure it out in 10 years. Working on it every day? I'm positive I could. I don't know, I don't know anything about rockets. What, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, if a simpleton like me can pull up, could put, could point this stuff out, like, what, what's going on here? You know, like, yeah, I think, you, you know, I think you're absolutely right in saying, like, why aren't they testing this stuff more, you know? Why, why were these testing regimes approved? Do we think we're that good? Well, clearly we're not. Clearly we're not that good. The interesting thing to me is that Orion, when it was the crew exploration vehicle, not the multi-purpose crew vehicle, whatever the hell that means now, yeah, I'm, I'm failing to see any other purpose for it right now, but... <laughs> it's a turbocharger. Um, when it was the CEV, they called for rotating it off of the ISS on Ares-1 with a very robust testing regime to test long-duration missions with the Orion capsule. We... So all of a sudden, we just said, no, nah, we don't need to do any of that. We could just do it once, and then we're good. There's no way. There's no way. I wouldn't believe anybody. Dude, not even SpaceX. I wouldn't even believe SpaceX. If they flew Starship once and then put people on it and then said, yeah, it's good, I'd be like, no, it's not. No, it's not. I don't, not because I have some any underlying information that, you know, I might know. I don't, certainly don't know more about space, SpaceX, uh, about their spacecraft than they do. Just... Empirically speaking, that's never worked. The only time it ever worked was STS-1, and that was because we got lucky. Yeah, we got lucky with the space shuttle. Yeah, I could land that airplane energy right in, which is ironic because it's coming from people that design aerospace components. It's It really is that. Do we think, do we think our eyes are, like, it's a question that I've brought up for a long time. Do we have the chops to do this? We haven't done it in 50 years. Look, man, Starliner is having problems because it's using components from a spaceship that stopped flying 12 years ago. Or no, thir 13 years now. Sorry, time flies. Why do we think we can replicate what we did 50 years ago and have it be fine? I, I think it's a poignant question to ask, and I'd be wonder I'd wonder what the answers to those questions are. At this point, they should put a uncrewed Orion on Falcon Heavy for three to four flights. Well, when we were talking about that Hellfish, when that you know earlier this year when they pushed Artemis out, that's what I said. That's that would be my that would be my thing right now. I would shoot a contract to SpaceX to launch Orion multiple times into low earth orbit and over the next four to five years test everything you possibly can that would delay that would delay artemis missions obviously but they're gonna, they're already delayed so screw it why not why not why wouldn't you you are it's already gonna get delayed you might as we'll get some flight data out of it Yeah, no, Shex, I think that's a very interesting question to ask, for real. Like, once again, we don't know better, but all I'm doing is looking at the trends from past spaceflight endeavors, and what other thing do we have to operate off of, right? Like,
Even SpaceX, when they have a good test, they do it again. Yeah, I'd be skeptical of anybody that does some that does something like that. Even SpaceX with their rapid prototyping, I'd still be like, nah, nah, don't fly people on that on the second try, or the third try, or the eighth try, or the twentieth try. Yeah, Aquilux, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. They're going to catch a booster on the first try. Yeah, but there's, they have to. Illness, that's a little bit of a different kind of circumstance than what's going on. Um, it's a little bit of a different circumstance because SpaceX is under the gun to get that lander finished. Which I've always said, basically, since HLS, that they're probably going to deliver it on time, if not just a little bit behind schedule. A little bit behind schedule is better than, like, five years late. Like, if it's a year late, considering... Just, I mean, I'm just putting it out there. Anyway. Let me uh, switch this over. But yeah, they, I'm not sure why we think we're, you know, just because we did it 50 years ago that we could do it again and it's really not an issue. It's really not. You're, you, you, we, like I said, we have trouble retaining technical expertise on a capsule that's, with a, when a capsule uses components from a vehicle, you know, 12 years, 13 years ago, let alone 50, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's a poignant question to ask. But anyway, I, I think the Polaris Dawn mission is going to be awesome. It's going to be really good. It's going to be really fun. It's going to be a really good mission. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the second and especially the third one. It's going to be great. Sorry, that was mostly a joke. Still give them a 50-50 chance. It's it's not about chance. Well, it is about uh, it is about chance illness, but I what I'm trying to what I'm trying to tell you is that yeah, that mission is going to carry a very big amount of risk. It's going to carry a lot of risk because they have to get that lander done on time. And there's uh, frankly no way you're going to deliver that lander anywhere near a punctual schedule if you can't catch a booster. Starship needs to refuel very rapidly. They need to refuel 12 times, let's say. That's 12 flights for a super heavy booster in less than a week. Or at least at the very, let's say they can mitigate boil off two weeks, three weeks at best. That's still an insanely high flight rate for a very short amount of time. You're going to manufacture 13 super heavies to do that? That would be catastrophically cost prohibited, prohibitive at that point. Catching the booster, it has to be done. You have to do it. SpaceX's architecture doesn't work without it. Now, what you could do is have disposable starships for this part of, for this part of the mission. Right, but expect using expendable stacks to get that lander out there, not gonna not gonna work. Like that would be a catastrophic financial loss for SpaceX. But they could do it if they had to. You got to catch the booster. So I think SpaceX is willing to roll the dice a little more than what they usually would be, because catching the booster is one of those things you're never gonna you're never gonna know how it works until you go and do it. So yeah, I mean. The point that I'm getting at in regards to your comment, I know you're kidding, but this is just for everybody else. Um, yeah, it's this is a risk. It's risky. It, it probably I, I don't know if they'll get it. If they get it, I'll be very impressed. Uh, that'll be that'd be a monumentous moment because there's an insane amount of risk to your booster, to your pad, to your company if you don't get it. But uh, I will say either way, it's gonna make the no, most not, awesome. Not freaking footage around if that thing pops when they go to land it. it it'll be pretty cool. Hey, Rip Perry, what's up, man? When do you expect Pad B to be operational? By the end of the year, most likely. Anyway, let's, I've loaded up Maya. I gotta load up Unity. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, baby. Discovery, go at throttle up.
Hey, you're in 37 month resub. Thank you. It's a great picture. And Rook needs Rook really needs some T38s, dude. Yeah, uh, Jared Isaac Minow owns all those planes. He just owns a small a small squadron of fighter jets, which is, you know, some al looks like three Alpha jets, two L39s. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, he didn't fly the MiG-29. Rook didn't choose to... He didn't take the MiG-29 out. I think... Uh, yeah, it's probably a good reason for that. It's only a model. Shh, 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 shh. He needs a few F-4s or Thunder Chiefs. You think Flight 5 is in the cards for you? Yeah, maybe. It's possible. He also got a new one. What did he score? Oh yeah, this thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They're uh Yeah, the Panavia. Ooh, hello. Yeah, Aqualex, there's only so many, so much testing that you can do, and I think to that extent they've done pretty much the extent of their testing. Oh, baby. Yeah, Tornado. That's a cool plane, man. Panavia Tornado. It's basically kind of like a... um. I was going to say it's kind of like an A-10 or an Su-25. Kind of, but not, but kind of. Tornadoes are, can do a bunch of different things. Yeah, sweet freaking plane, dude. That F-14, yeah. All right, so I have GIMP open. We have Maya open. Let's open the Unity here. They used to be the mainstay before the Eurofighter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that thing. Good stuff. So this is the part that we've been working on. It's actually, it's two pieces. It's a hinge, a hinge strengthening device. Uh, let me get the tunage up here. go unity there it is so the hinge strengthening device we have gone through putting this into ksp and we've used it in ksp a couple of times now what i'm really focusing on this week is texturing this piece what i want is a very stock alike look to the hinge that it's designed to work with so in case you're unfamiliar with this piece or these pieces i should say um Give me one second. So this stuff is designed to work with the G11 hinge right here. The G11 hinge is one of the robotic parts from KSP-1's Breaking Ground DLC. This piece is designed to attach on the bottom and the top of this thing. And what this thing is designed to do is clamp it and then utilizing same vessel interaction, it's designed to basically strengthen the hinge. The hinges in KSP are good, but they use using physx joints, which was one of the only ways the devs could get these things to work right. Using physx joints makes ends up having these things be, be a little springy. So these pieces are attachable pieces here 
that you can attach to the hinge to kind of remove the springiness of the hinge because it utilizes same vessel collision to get it to work right. So, what I want to do is, we, I mean, we've successfully showed the pipeline that you need to take this piece, put it into, put it into Unity, right? And then put that into KSP from there. We've demonstrated that the hinge works. And now I, what I really want to do is texture it. Because it's designed to work with the G11 hinge right there, there you can see I have, we used a model to kind of get the dimensions for it. We, we, we got the model from KSP and we, we got the dimensions of the thing. Uh, I want it to look like it. So what we did was we took the textures, we took the texture, the texture map for the, um, for the hinge, I put them here. I put them here and I'm trying to draw up some stock alike textures. Now Rover Dude did the original texturing on the robotics here and I'm trying to texture my stuff in the same style as him. So when we go to put this in KSP, it looks like it belongs with the hinge. That's what we're trying to do here. So today we're gonna to be working on texturing and I've done a little bit of texturing here, what you can see. Uh, I think you should have branded your parts. I. Uh, there you go. That good enough? I haven't finished the texture yet. We barely got one piece done. And just spray paint EJ on the side. So yeah, that's what we're working on now. And uh, yeah, we're gonna get that all figured out. Sorry, jumping ahead. Yeah, I haven't finished. So we gotta we gotta start really texturing this thing. And I'm what I'm trying to do is mimic Rover Dude's kind of metal texture scratchiness that's going on here. Um, I really should figure out how to do more defined lines in this. So uh, uh, the reason why this has taken me a second with the texturing is because I don't know GIMP very well, the texture editing program that I'm working with. So I've been learning it kind of as I go. So yeah, give me one second, dudes. I have to actually take a piss and then we'll, uh, we'll get back into it. I'll keep texturing this and then I'll bring it in to Maya and see what the texture looks like on the part. And then we can eventually, if we get the texturing done on these pieces, we bring them into KSP and then have fun with them further over there with a finished hinge part that looks like it belongs in the game. I also have my tablet here. We gotta plug it in. But I have my tablet here, the, the Wacom tablet for painting textures as well. I got that all hooked up. Oh, actually, that reminds me. The Remarkable has been charging since I left it on Friday. I'm going to, while I go to the bathroom, I'm going to go see if that's charged and ready to go. I am fully charged. I'll be right back. Thank you. 
Archibald is working. But we have two tabs to be able to paint our textures with, hopefully. We'll see. Um, not sure what I'm gonna do with this right now. Put it on the soundboard. What can be wrong? What can go wrong? All right. Let's see if the Telestrator works. It works, dude. This works too. See? So what is what is this? Why do why would you have a tablet? Well, if I have the tablet, I can draw. I can draw instead. Ready? E. J. See? You can use it to draw your textures. Yep. You could also use it to do whatever that was. All right, excellent. Can you fly a plane with it? Um, I don't know. So what I'm doing here, guys, if you look, it depends on what you're doing, okay, speed. I'm pretty good with the mouse and keyboard. Like I can texture just fine with it, but we could also use this if we have an application for it. Sorry, man, I bought it. Might as well get my money's worth. So. So once again, we have Roberdude stock textures here, and I'm not going to use those, but I want to replicate them. I'm not looking to just copy it. So I would like to get, uh, yeah, there's the decals. I'd like to go in and see kind of how he did this. I really want to focus more on making kind of straight lines here. So if we just go in and... Let's just erase that and let's see if we can... So it's clear that I can make that texture, but we might have multiple areas here and here that need that type of paint, right? So let's think about this for a second. You know, I'm surgical with this thing, Jake. I see how he did the textures. Yeah, there's oh yeah, he has textures overlapping each other, which is pretty cool. Hmm. Is Gimp good enough for this type of job? Sure. I've been drawing out the stock textures there. Guys, this is what I've already done. Here, let me let me get rid of the UVs. See? I, d I drew this with GIMP, and that, that looks pretty close to the part. I've just been eye-dropping colors from Rover Dude's color, color palette here. Uh, just, yeah. We just have to add more stuff to it. This outline right here, actually, it looks pretty good without it, but it does look, I do like it with. But that's not exactly... Giving me exactly what Rover Dude has in his textures. Just gotta blur it out, blur it out a little bit. That's fine. That looks good. It really, yeah, it doesn't look too bad. Came out okay. Yeah, it's kind of like Photoshop, but obviously it's not exactly the same. It's close enough though. Good enough. Let's see. So, 
I like this part. I want to see if we can draw some decals on it, but I'm thinking about this now. If we're looking at, so this edge right here, um, this piece is actually on the inner hinge, and this is something I didn't really realize. So if we just take this part and no, transparent that out, we go into the outliner. Right? The edge that we're working on is back here. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, let me think, let me think, how can we do this? I, it would be nice to be able to see the texture in Maya and then also see it in Unity. Uh, so we need to go about assigning the texture to these pieces. Why is Oculus on? Get out of here. Oh, I picked up the headset during the interview. That's right. Let's think. No, I gotta kind of get myself in the right frame of mind here. Um, so get rid of that, get rid of that, right? And then we're going to take this. We don't want to save it as an XCF. We want to export. We want to export it as a PNG, hinged owl map painted dot PNG. Yeah, all right, let's just export that and let's see what this gets us. So now that we have that exported, let me see where I should probably have seen, figured out where the command line was for this. It's in new KSP assets images. So that's perfect for Maya. So go in here and now let's go into our hypershade, which is basically assigning shaders and textures. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna make a new shader, okay? We're gonna make a new fong. Fong is, yeah material shader. So this is, this will be hinge upper shader shader. Okay. And then from there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into color and then we're going to attach a file to it. And now the file, let's load uh We gotta load uh, image name. It's right in front of me, idiot. Hinged Owl Map UV painted. All right, cool. So we have that. Now let's take. Oh no, Hinged Owl Map Shader, right there. Let's take that, Hinge Upper, select that, apply. And look, there's our texture, already painted texture, right there. Score. See, there it is, in Maya. Oh yeah, Sneaky, absolutely. You look at this thing up close right here there are parts of the texture that don't have any texture information on them right so some of it is appearing a little bit transparent discovery go at throttle up what the hell's going on with the surface normals hey mute in They're not inverted, Nando. You can see the texture in the right spot. No, that, it's something else. They're not inverted normals.
Normals are fine. It's something in the texture information with an alpha channel. Yeah, definitely something in the alpha channel. If you, that, none of that made any sense, just bear with me, dudes. Yeah. Hmm. gonna have to do the same thing in unity we're gonna have to plug the shader in i'm trying to what i'm gonna try to do guys is see if it shows if the same thing happens over here so uh, all right i gotta figure out how to do that Is there a way to fix the other robotic parts? If I made parts for them, sure, Ren. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, the alpha, alpha gain. That's, yeah, there we go. Now it's good. Well, that kind of fixed it, but it kind of didn't. I don't know why. We might need to go mess with the alpha channel and the texture, but alpha channel is how you basically make stuff that's see-through. Um, if you've ever seen like a tree in a video game, you ever notice guys that if you look at like a tree in a, in a video game from the top, it's just two polyagonal planes that are look like a plus sign and they just, each polygon just has branch like a picture of a tree on it right and if you put two of them together it looks like a tree from far away but if you get up close you see that it's just a two flat planes the alpha channel is the part that assigns the transparency transparent information to that texture alpha channels are super useful for optimization in video games because you don't need to model every freaking branch you need to model you model two pieces Two pieces of 3D, right? And then you assign a texture with an alpha channel to it and it looks like a tree. But sometimes, see that line right there? That's not good. I don't know why it's doing that. So what I need to do I need to confirm that if this is what's going on in Maya or or what. So let's go in here. We need to make a shader for we need to make a shader. So Hmm. 
These things... These things clearly have a shader plugged in. Oh, select shader. Huh. Yeah, Jody, something, something is... Yeah, that's not working. Didn't like that. Wait. No. Break that connection. Oh, it, it plugging in a file plugged in a transparency shader, which is not what I want. Cool. That, all right, cool, I got it. So yeah, we started to see the textures in there. Cool, all right, so yeah, all right, I, I figured it out, we got it. So like, for instance, if I turn this on, if I turn on the UV map, right, what this is basically gonna do, if we export as, export is the same thing, replace it, export the same data, right? And we go back into Maya, Right? It'll, oh, Maya automatically updates. It never used to do that for me. That's uh, how far I've been out of the gates. So we can also make sure that we shut off face normals. Yeah, see? It drew the geometry on there. You see that? Interdasting. Can you change the mapping on your model? Sure. Yeah, Lisa, of course you can. The other thing I'm gonna do, we're gonna load up KSP here, and I need to look at that hinge. Is the texture lined up correctly? Yeah, of course it is, Creeper. Mm -hmm. Hey, Geek. Frickin' Mondays, Give it a second. The whole texture is gray, Creeper, right now, except for that one base that I made. Hours later. Kalani, yeah. So what I did, guys, to fix that transparency thing was I unplugged the transparency information from the file information. That's there by default, and yeah, that's what that's what screwed it up. So the textures won't be updated because I haven't updated them in Maya. What I really want to do is just look at the G11 hinge and have Kerbal open. We also see how it snaps to absolute. 
I gotta do, I have to change some attachment information. See when it snaps absolute, it leaves that gap right there. I don't want that. Also, we do need to work on the tolerances, right? Because when I attach this, watch. If I attach this and then select the upper part of the hinge and then move it, see, it snaps into position. It's very subtle, but we do need to fix that. That should all be pretty easy. What I'm really looking at is how Rover Dude did the shading and lighting for this. Like, we have the gray textures, that's no problem, right? But where where on this are we gonna wanna put, like, text? Like, we could put G11 extension right here, and then G11 extender over here. And where do we want to, uh, where do we wanna paint? Like, where do we want the caution tape to be, see? Like, we want, obviously want something like this right here, and then the positive and negative right there. And then down the bottom right here, we'd want our stripe. So, we're texturing the top piece right now. Right? And the top piece, where the part that I've been texturing is this kind of background tab piece right there. Right? Like, right here. We don't really need any text there. There, there doesn't need to be anything there, because, you know why? Because when the hinge is attached, you can't see that. So... Yeah, I wanted Kerbal open so we can mimic this style. We also got to put the holes right here. Once again, I'm just straight up trying to mimic Rover Dude's textures. I'm not trying to copy it. I'm trying to make my own, you know? Oh man, his has a normal map on it too. I got to figure out how to do all this again. Holy balls. All right, well, let's... Let's go back over here into old Gimpy. Actually, let's go to Maya first. Shove, shove that out. Now, where do we want... Hmm, I'm thinking. Look back at the hinge. Looking at Rover Dude's stuff from the side. So there's caution tape and then a plus and a minus. All right, so on this edge right here, this edge is right there. That's where we'd want to put our plus and minus, right? So we'd put the plus on this side, minus on that side. All right, so let's go in here like this. Figure out where that all that's all going on here. So here's what we can do. A couple of tricks that we can do now. See that? See what I just did there? So we have main color, wear and tear. I didn't do any decals. So I was going to paint decals on it, but that's not a part. We don't need decals right there. And then we have our outline. I'm going to take these. I'm going to take that layer, and I'm going to put it in a new layer group. And we'll just name that tab one, right? Put the outline in there. Put the wear and tear in there. I put the main color in there, right? That line's got to be on top. Wear and tear's got to be on top of main color, right? Check that out. Looks good, right? Do you want a normal map? You just make a high-res model and bake it into the map, right? Uh, let's focus on the texture right now. Um, so now we have that tab. That looks all fine and dandy. So we should be able to... That's good enough. I like that texture. This The way this came out is pretty sweet. We got pretty good wear and tear. It looks good enough. Um, looking at it in Maya, you know, I'm pretty sure that's that's what we want. So I'm going to shut off the UV map. Or actually, I'm going to keep it on for a second. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this group. Do we have a duplicate option here? Duplicate. Tab two. All right, so now take that, go into our translate function, right? Back this out. It didn't move the entire group. All right, let's try doing it with a marquee select.
why would you do this this way? Why would you put this functionality in here like this? That makes no sense. would GIMP do that that way? I don't... Copy groups in Photoshop just saying. What what does that help, Creeper? I'm using this because I don't have a license for Photoshop. I don't I don't understand how's that what what okay, yeah, thanks. That's kind of the point that I'm trying to make here. I'm Think that Critic could do this a thousand times better. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I couldn't... I don't have Photoshop, so I don't... I don't have, uh... I don't procure software illegally for streaming usage, because that's unacceptable. Because you wouldn't download a car, right? So, yeah, I can't really get my hands on one right now. I'm just trying to... I have these three layers... Right? And I'm just trying to copy them. I'm trying to duplicate them so I can just put them over here. I'm just not understanding why it won't let me do that. What are you using for software? This is GIMP? We can duplicate it now, right? You see that? We can we can duplicate it, but when I take the copy, it doesn't move the right layers. This is where I'm getting confused. We can duplicate it just fine, right? I want to take tab two and I want to move it over here. And you can't you can't select click it every layer. Like if I take tab two, theoretically it should move parent parts. It's the, now it's just defaulted to... It moves what is clicked on, not is not what is selected. Can't select a whole layer and move it though. Go to active layer. Zavik, thank you. That's what I was wondering. There's always a way to do it. It's just slightly different over every program. So now, boom. We have the same tab. What I'm going to do, though, is that big scratch. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to get rid of it on this side. We're actually going to paint over that. Let's get darker gray. Go into main color and just paint over that scratch. Just get rid of it. I don't want them to look exactly the same, you know?
go into main color, switch here, go to a lighter gray, get the brush tool. Oh. That looks like Dookie, but whatever. That's the right idea. I just think that's a little too distinct for what's going on. Ain't over that, but I also... We also need to... We, we must go deeper. There we go. I just don't want these things to look exactly the same. Let's go into the wear and tear and erase some of that. Nope. Go back into main color, flip back over to brush. I'm just trying to make the textures not look exactly the same. That's all. Go back into wear and tear, flip this to a lighter. We, we could even go white, a big white texture, and then we can get a scattery brush. Nope, that's way too much. down a little more, lower the size. Symmetrical wear and tear is very unlikely. See, that's good enough. It's good enough. So now we take that, that's tab one, and that's tab two. Take this, if we export as a PNG, replace the current PNG, right? Export it, bring this back into Maya. It should update the texture, and now we go up with it, look. Textures on both sides. Good. I'll S L I'll, I'll probably end up just buying it myself, dude. Don't worry about it, but thank you. Looks a little weird with the lighting in Maya, but that should be right. Okay. Go back down in here like this, and this, the other thing is still checker blue because we haven't, we're not even close to getting that right, so. Now let's get back in here like this. Now, I'm going to paint this part right here, this texture. Um, let me, once again, load up Rover Dude's textures here and use it. You can use it to, to bring out the palette. See, his e around the edges, he's real defined. See what I'm saying? Gimp has a, yeah, there's a, you can do elliptical and you can do rectangular select. So what I can do is something like this, right? And this is back in tab one. We'll, we'll add this to the outline. 
go under the brush. And we're gonna swap for a, the darkest gray that I have in the palette. Okay. Now take the brush. something here yeah brush tool all right cool I screwed up I'm this is what I mean. I'm not good at texture. <laughs> I gotta get better at this. All right, let's go to master outline. Let's just paint in the outline with this brush, but we want it real sharp around the edges, like that. Perfect. All right, cool. Now, I'm gonna go in and we're gonna put main color. Just n name it main color too. Put it, we need to put it in front of the outline. And now let's go back here, get our light, not the light-ish gray, but the lightest that we have. And then we... I don't need that brush. I need one with a fall off right there. Uh, no, more fall off than that. This will work. Lower the size. Uh, and then we want to lower the hardness of that brush. I'm just trying to get that defined edge like, like what Rover Dude's textures have. See how it's darker towards the edge? Well, yeah, it's just a, it's just a smidge. I think you did this by painting the outline on a separate layer. That's why I want a brush with fall off right here so we can kind of get that gradient ish thing that's going on there around his edges. Right? That's pretty good. Back it off again, see if we can see the difference. Let's hit it, hit it again. Hit him again! the idea it's good now we're gonna add wear and tear too so let me get a big brush we need a big brush. We actually we don't need a big brush necessarily. What what I really want is hard brush head because it's we're gonna paint like scratches and stuff, right? See, there's scratches all over these parts, so you need a defined brush because that's what a scratch is. Scratch is another metal piece of hit hitting the metal, right? So we want something that does not have a lot of hardness. We want something that's really low size and then just, nope, way too much, way too much. Just, just 
still. There we go. That's more what we're looking for. So let's do one, two, three. Now, scratches tend to be more straight than that. There we go. You know what? If I'm looking at that right, that might be done with an eraser. There's nothing to erase there. Flip the brush. Flip us back over to brush and get us back to these settings here. Paint in off the background texture. That would probably help. Because with the background, I'm kind of you're kind of getting fooled a little bit into thinking the texture is there when it's not. So let's go. We can go back into wear and tear with that brush again and make it small and just yeah. Let's. I got an idea. Give me a brush that has a lot of noise like that. We want big size. Rotate the angle 90 degrees like that. And then we don't want a lot of hardness. Yeah, we do. Yeah, there we go. Cool. All right. Um, now, we need to touch lighter than that. There we go. Painted some texture in there. Perfect. A little bit. That's, that's fine. That looks it's more or less what we're looking for. Now, uh, let's go into wear and tear. And I'm going to get the eraser. And I want a hard brush with the eraser. And back over to brush get the white out and just oh geez no <laughs> we do want a lot of force right there just no that's too much i need to make that fall off a lot more so i'm gonna go in here like this yeah see Now what I want to do is go over that brush with the same brush, but with the eraser and just I want to fade them out a little bit. Make the brush a little bit bigger. There, good enough. That's fine, perfect. That's, that's it. That's, that's good enough for what we're trying to do. So take, take what we have here. Uh, let's go into our selector tool. We're here, move the active layer. We need to go, we select that new layer group, put that in there, put that in there and put the outline in there. Outline should be underneath everything. Main color. Perfect. 
Yeah, I haven't seen Rover Dude in a good minute, dude. Now, if we take that, right, we can copy, duplicate that layer group, base one copy, and then we should just... Move it into the same position. See, you know, we could have done this with overlapping UVs. If we did, we'd overlap these UVs, it would have been fine, but that's a rookie mistake because I haven't done this in a little while. We could have overlapped the UVs and both sides would be textured at once. That's why you, in this, you kind of only see half of, um, you only see half of the hinge pieces and you see half of the caution tape because Rover Dude used overlap, overlapping UVs, which is smart. Um, that's not going to be that big of a deal, but why would you want to do overlapping UVs? Because you only have a you only have a square, and the higher resolution that square is, the worse it uh, it, like it, it'll put more stress on your graphics card that way. You can keep the textures low res if you have UVs that are overlapping that are showing the same texture. In that regard, these two should have shown the exact same texture, but whatever. You learn from your mistakes. I'll make I won't make that mistake next time. Now. What we could do, because this is such a small part, what we could do is just say frick it and redo the UVs to overlap the components that we think would be right. That would probably be better. We could certainly make this a lot nicer. Especially since I kind of got a workflow for duplicating this stuff. I kind of see what, how he did it. Um, it makes sense like we can pretty much duplicate we can duplicate it over from what rover dude originally made versus what we're doing it's not that it shouldn't be too big of a deal to do something like that you could also put both of these parts on the same texture you built this okay yeah, I saw that when you linked it to me over the weekend on Discord. Nice. Hi. Hi. What is this? You could paint the texture directly on the model in Maya. I don't know if that option is available in my LT. I didn't know, sorry. No, it's all good, man. All good. Yeah, I saw it, dude. It's, it's cool. It, your EUS looks great. Here's the thing, it's gonna take some work to go and redo the UVs to get them right, right? But it's also gonna, that could make our texturing workflow go a lot faster. So it's gonna take work to go back and redo the UVs, but it's also gonna take work if, to, to just finish this out. The question is, which one is faster? Don't know. Trying to build an SLS leather centric system. Yeah. Cool. In the meantime, what I want to do is shut that off, shut that off, and then let's export again. And let's punch it back into Maya. Look, see, now we have more painted texture. All right. See? 
be complete with the scratches that we just did. I see. I don't know why there's a lot of scratches right there, why I decided to paint that like that, but anyway. And oh, remind me to re-export this model because I have some crappy face normals in it. You could apply the G11 to its texture to compare. Yeah, look, I never noticed that. Look. Look, it's symmetrical. The textures, the textures mirrored. Rover dude, you tricky, tricky, tricky bastard. Smart. Man, that guy's, that guy's, he's pretty damn smart. Look, see how the scratches? The scratches are in symmetry. You sneaky, and they don't even line up right there. There's a seam. You mother, how did I never notice that? Look, there's a seam right there. Dude, he's good, man. He's real good. Never noticed that before. <laughs> Dang. I never noticed, never even bothered. That's the plight of texturing, dude. You paint something and you're like, that looks like trash and you put it in the game and you can't unsee your mistake and everybody else doesn't even notice. Yep. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big thing. Yeah. thinking now now I'm thinking you know what I'm really looking at my model is too bland you have to add like I've been I'm kind of staring at it and I'm like maybe I should add more geometry in here like see how he has those the step these stepped pieces in there Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't think I I think I'm out of the gates for refunding this dude's pretty sure. Overkill? All right. I'm just worried if I paint the exact textures and put the exact dots on it that it might not look I just made I'm making the exact same mistake I was just telling you guys about. Never mind. Just keep painting the damn texture. I might just do that workflow, what I just did for the rest of the hinge, and kind of go from there. I don't know. Should we? Should we mess with the workflow? I don't think so.
Yeah. Coffee left. All right, you know what? We'll make optimizations later if we feel like it. I'm just gonna paint this damn texture, okay? That's what I want. I want better. I want more definition there. Yeah, now we're talking. That really matches more. Well, actually, no. It's a little bit too light. Actually, you know what? I drop this. I drop that texture right there. And then paint our background that exact color. That'll do it. We should really put this into Unity and not Maya. You know what? Let's 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 make a shader for Unity and figure out how to do this. Um, how do we do a shader here? It imported the Fong UV checker shader. They call it materials in Unity, though. The shader should update. There we go. 
upper hinge mat. There we go. So uh Oh, shh. Wow, you can do all that in Kerbal, huh? Okay. How do we, we should be able to add. I mostly use diffused and specular bump shaders. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's up? Going to lurk for a bit. Definitely need more sleep. Yeah. Yeah. How do I unassign that material to it. Can we can we remove component here? Or? Hmm. Drag the new one onto it. Mutter, I like you. You're all right. Now, how the heck do we plug a uh, material into this shader? Specular, I don't want that. Hmm. Obviously, we want to use a KSP shader, right? I'm just trying to see if we could bring the materials in here because we could get a much better uh, idea of how how it looks. And then we could easily export to Unity to see how it looks in KSP if we did it here. Drag and drop the images into Diffuse and Specular. Now we gotta bring a texture in here though.
Yep, there we go. Brought it in. Can you make a lot of scratches where the two parts meet so it looks like they're doing the same vessel interaction? Yeah, we could, of course. Yeah, Unity's just drag and drop. You know, I'm sure Maya's drag and drop too. It's just me being a dinosaur again when it comes to this stuff. See, check this out. Look at the difference. Look at the difference between Maya and Unity. It's that part is coming out super dark in Unity. That's what I was worried about. We gotta plug normal and stuff in. Um, that's gonna suck. I have no idea how to paint a normal map. I don't remember how to do it. Or I, I mean, I know what occlusion does, but yeah, I'm very much missing the process here. Change the shader. We gotta set it to a KSP shader. No, we do not want specular. We need KSP alpha. This might be easier to directly paint the part in Blender. Why would switching the CAD software Help me. I'm confused. Yeah, with that diffuse shader, we really, 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 really need to lighten up that texture, huh? So let's go back over here. Uh, visualize what you pick. Uh, that's, no, no one's using Blender here. I have Maya and I've already done that. See?
I know what we need to do, but I don't really want to do it. That's all right, Sea Kraken, don't worry. Lazy JSA, shut the hell up. <laughs> yeah, Noobly, yeah, I hadn't UV'd anything in such a long time. I know what I need to do. We gotta do this right. I wanna do it right. I don't wanna relearn this and build bad habits, so let's I let's reUV it. I don't wanna build bad habits, guys. Yeah. Gotta do it right. Sit here until you do it right. You know, you, there's the whole perfect is the enemy of good, but if you don't even know how to do it good, how are you gonna know or if you don't know how to do it perfect, how do you know what good is? You know what I mean? You gotta do it right. You have to. We're gonna take a little bit of a step back here. And I'm just going to go through into my UV maps and we're going to redo them. Particularly, I'm going to... Yeah, see, we're, we're just going to end up making a lot more texturing work if we don't sit here. Okay, so let me go into UV shell. Go like this, and then there's a... Oh, where's the one to automatically find the best projection? Do it right. We got time. Exactly. You know what? It caught up my UVs doing that. Um, I don't necessarily want that. Um, I want to see if we can fit these. Is there a fit tool? I want to fit the shells that I have, not, not auto map. Yeah, where's the auto pack? edge go back select everything go to UV shell make sure we're set on shell and then let's try that layout tool again bingo very nice oh newly that one cuts that one cuts pretty deep so I'm taking a little bit of a step back here with you being this thing. Actually, one thing I wanted to do. Right. 
rotate that shell. This will allow us to make a lot more higher resolution textures. Guys, th this is good. This is what we want. Dude, we could go even crazier. Jeff, what's up, dude? My name is Jeff. How you doing? See, I'm wondering now if we could build in, building in some, see our base plate there. Maybe we should mess with this a little bit. Maybe we should mess with the design. Just a smidge. Too bad. You would play in Fallout London? Cool. What is this part going to be? It's a hinge. It's an assistant piece to the hinge, Zymus. Look. So what this thing does is, if you put same vessel interaction here and same vessel interaction here, it'll strengthen the hinge so the hinge isn't as new as wobbly. That was the whole idea behind this. Pretty cool, huh? See what I'm what I'm debating here is that if we're gonna UV it, might as well put some edge flow, like just put some bends in here to not make it look bad, you know? Like uh, because this looks really plain. It's a really plain piece. But then again, maybe with a texture on it, it wouldn't look as bad, but yeah. But I see that Rover dude, when he did the model, he put, there's a bunch of, like, see those hoses right there? What do those do? Those don't do anything. It's not even part of the collider box. It's just there to make the hinge not look super freaking plain. It's, it's, same with these stepped pieces in there. Now, I'm not saying I need to do stepped pieces in there. We could, but the collider for this is already pretty high res. I don't want anything else being high res. I'm just talking about a couple of little bends or something that we could put in to make it not look stupid. Yeah, it, yeah, XJ, exactly. So I don't mind the way it is, but you know, if we're gonna sit here and redo the damn UVs, UV didn't, UV didn't take me very long. And I wouldn't mind taking a step back because, you know, like, here's my thing, guys. I get it. Perfect's the enemy good. But if I don't know how to how to make it perfectly, then I don't know how to make it good. I, I, I have to relearn this. Are you still texturing the part? Yes. Could use some nice runs from Polygon, maybe. I don't know what that means. You could make it mimic the top part of the hinge. We could. We could make it align. See, even a little bend like that, 
that's see that see what it did it totally changed the shape just a little just a little movement totally changed it completely see what i'm talking about that's what i'm talking about that's what I, that's what i mean just even moving that line down to make it look like how rover dude modeled it like the whole guys once again the whole thing is i want these two parts to connect to each other like this in Kerbal, and when they do, I my expectation here is that this looks like it belongs attached to that. Now, this speaks to a little bit of game development, and it speaks to why I'm so you know, retentive about stuff like this. When I'm building stuff in KSP, when we're making parts, which we haven't done pretty much ever, but the reason why is because, okay, so this, once again, a little bit on game development here. If I don't make this part look like it fit, it fits with the hinge, if a player downloads my mod, it's not going to be intuitive. It's not going to be intuitive. I have to make it look like it belongs on that hinge. If I don't, if I don't make the leg, the puzzle pieces look like they fit together, no one's going to understand what the heck this hinge does. And then that makes more work for me down the line saying that, oh, well, and, and in the particular case of game design, you would need more tutorials. You would need more time explaining how this stuff all goes together rather than having it be just completely intuitive. If I write G11 hinge on this thing and I put plus signs and minus signs in the same spot that Roverdew did on his hinges, I mean, not, I mean, I could technically just cut, we could just cut pieces of his texture out and put it on different parts of ours if we really wanted to be cheap about this, right? But I, I don't feel comfortable. I don't think that's a good idea. I'd rather paint it myself, show that I can replicate it and go from there. But we could do it that way. But the whole idea is that I need this to be intuitive. I need it to look like it belongs there, right? And because once again, you know, in the future, someone could go to download my mod. And they won't really understand why, why this is the way that it is. And that's the plight of every modder if you're going to make a specialized part like this. Like if I have a mod and the mod is just a rocket engine, right? Obviously, you know where it's going to go. Like it's a rocket engine goes to the bottom. Anybody that plays Kerbal knows that. This is not so intuitive here as a rocket engine. You don't know how this stuff is placed. You could even put top in the same G11 font. Bingo. Exactly. Exactly. I'm even considering making these edges stepped. Like, see how the, the edges stepped in? Like, it stepped in and then it bends up and out? This side up. Yeah, exactly. Stuff like that. We got, I want to. That's why I'm so anal about repaint, uh, repainting these textures to make them look exact, to make it look like it matches. Now, Rover Dude even did toggle, toggleable stuff, which is still cool. We, I'm not that cool, so... How about stripes like on the pivots? Well, yeah, of course. But going back to what I was looking at, like I, I made this as basic as possible the first time around. I made the model very simple, Alex. We did that on purpose. So um, I did that on purpose just to kind of go through the pipeline to make sure I remembered how to do this. Now that I know how to do this, and now that I know that putting parts in KSP is really not that big of a deal, I want to change some edges to this piece to, once again, make it look more like it fits, like that. That edge right there. See, if I'm redoing the UVs, right? I gotta redo the UVs to do that overlapping thing so we don't, we only have to basically texture half of this part, right? Which is the idea. Um, you might as well just add some, mo add some, add some of this in. And we like texturing the UV, doing the UV on this because it's such a simple part, it's not that big of a deal. So even going as so far as like, um, I don't know, uh, let me think. Like if we just go into object and we go into edge mode here, right? And we take these edges and we move them out in such a way that makes it look like, see what I'm talking about? Makes it look like the hinge. If we go into the side view here. See? Now it matches the hinges profile. See what I'm talking about there? That's the kind of stuff. Little things like that. would That would also make replicating Rover Dude's stuff a lot easier. What about that side view? Check out that side. You like that side view? Well, you shouldn't, because that's my side view.
Like, let's go through and do, well, in the industry, you'd call it a detail pass on this piece. We have our minimum viable product, and the whole point of this entire piece is that the hinge works, so we know the colliders work. So editing the geometry like this isn't gonna be that big of a deal. Especially just simple stuff like what I'm doing, we really won't need to mess with the collider boxes too much. Just make the edge a little bit bigger on the outside here, easy peasy. The main part of the collider that was the hard part to do was this hinge piece, and that's not gonna be a big deal. No one's gonna need an inset edge right there. That, that we don't need to pick up on the collider there, so yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get, like I said, give this thing a little bit of a detail pass and make it look nice. Like even here. Uh... Going here like this. Going here like this. I like that face. If we go into our side view, you see that rover dude stepped that edge out to add some detail onto the side. First of all, I didn't even notice that my extruded piece is not lining up. None of this stuff is... is flush. Oh. Oh. That's not cool. None of this stuff is flush with this with the bottom piece. No, that's I can't have that. I can't have it. I'm noticing problems with my model. We're gonna fix it. Like I said, this is not a lot of crazy changes here. What I am gonna do is take those those faces right there, and we are going to do an extrusion function on them. Then we're gonna make this go in a little bit. And then, I'm going to extrude them again, add a little bit of a step, and then ex extrude those edges again, and make them go in again. Just like Rover Dudes. See? He made them go out, stepped, and then out. Just little things like this. Yeah, that did add a lot more geometry to this shape, but... See that? That's a lot nicer. I like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here like this, go in here like that, here like this. We are going to soften the edges, right? And now, now it's not going to look nearly as neat. So we got to take those edges, edge loop, two edge loop, edge loop, harden, two edge loop, two edge loop. This is just a little bit of a detail pass on this stuff to make it look right. See? Oh, yeah, look at that. See what I'm talking about? It adds a little bit more geometry to this piece. It's okay. It's okay. We have 2,500 part... We have 2,500 face limit, guys. On that particular piece, we're at 284. Even with all that added in. 284? And that's nothing. That's nothing. We're good. Top part got a lot of loving. How about doing a detail pass on the bottom? Getting to it, man. I'm getting to it. <laughs> so we do need to re-UV. That's not a big deal. So uh, let's just take this and we'll save. And I'm probably gonna make another file, guys. We'll make a we'll make a new file with new UV maps. But this was a good practice run. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not gonna do this. Probably, I probably won't be doing this much more throughout this design, but yeah, this is, um, I like this this way. I think this is a good idea. All right. You want to do the now, like, look at the difference, man. That's a lot nicer looking part. And it looks like Rover dudes. It looks like it belongs there. The only other thing that I that we could do is add another step 
we could do this in there if we really wanted to, if we wanted to add a step, add a step piece. But if we added another stepper piece, I'd want it to be actually in between my two hinges right there, like it's in between on that one. Alex, we could do it. We could add stepper pieces in there, but that's gonna add a lot of mesh geometry, dude. Just like part count in KSP, you have a poly, you have a poly budget for parts. You don't want to exceed polys or else you're going to fry somebody's graphics card when they go to download this. This piece is the motor. Yeah, this is part of the hinge. Exactly. I'm thinking for the bottom piece, add the taper to the outside and then you know, we gotta, and then step it in. It's stepped in just like that piece. It's just stepped in a little bit different. So if we go down to this bottom piece here, the clevis piece, right? First thing that I'll do is take these edges right here. Two, three. Let me think. Now we have the luxury of these being symmetrical on multiple axes. So if we go to the top view, right? And we go here like that. And bye bye. We delete those faces. Now, what we do to one side will happen to the other. Easy peasy. I just gotta re mirror it and then we'll sew this sucker all back together. So I gotta take these edges. We gotta move these edges out. Like that. Now that's that's okay. We can go in here with our face normals, harden that sucker up so that's a, a defining line. But if you look, this thing from its plate has that ridge piece, right? And then it kind of, it goes in and then it kind of tapers up. So let's take that piece and we move it in. We do the same damn thing. Little stuff, just little edge, just move that edge in a little bit. Now this piece looks like it belongs. Amigo, you do belong. We could also do a high poly version and bake it. Yeah, if we wanted to. I'm also not 100% sure why I didn't snap to grid like that with this piece. take this piece and then move it like that. See? Oh yeah, there we go. I also noticed something when we were UVing this thing. What I noticed is that some of these, some of these vertexes aren't aligned. I noticed it, it came up in the UV. So if I take that, that, take that, do that. Some of it didn't come out perfectly straight in the UV. It's okay. Oh yeah. See? Now we're talking. Now that looks sick. Real good. Let me just look at Rover Dude's hinge piece again. Yeah. Yeah, I see what he did. I see what he did. And then he made him, yeah, see? Double-faced, so you can toggle it. Smart. Smart. RFA news. Yeah, I had a little bit of a setback, huh? We'll talk more about that. Oh crap, it's time for space news. Ah. 
All right, so no problem. We'll, uh, I'll take five at the top of the hour and we'll go from there. So now let's go back into shader view. If you look, my UVs for this are probably pretty um, awful. So let's take that, take that. That's the only pieces that we really modify or really added. So what I want to do is a planar UV operation here to project those. Oh, planar isn't actually going to work now, is it? Planar will work with every edge, every face except for those. So UV, let's go here. Modify, we need a planar map projection. Where are you, you sneaky, sneaky bastard? I oh, can just hit the hotkey for it. That'll work. Now for these faces, a cylindrical map projection would, oh my goodness, that's not right at all. to do a little bit of modification there, but that's okay. For Space News, I helped restore this. What? Really, Josh? How come you've never told me this? Why haven't you told me? Yeah. That's cool. Damn, Josh. Gosh, that's super cool, man. Yeah, so I'll make a seam right there, but there would be a seam there in real life, so I'm not too worried about it. You work a lot. I know how that is. All right, guys. Um... Yeah, we got to do another planar map projection here for this. Yeah, baby.
Nice. I'm using the checkerboard to see if the textures are, if my UVs are good. UVs, okay, so if you look, the texture, what's the texture for the shader that they have plugged in? It's a black, it's a black and blue checkerboard, right? That means I need to get everything on here to appear as a square. If it doesn't appear as a square, the texture is squashed and stretched, which is no good. You need it to be a checkerboard. You need it to look like a checkerboard. If it's not, if it doesn't look like a checkerboard, well, that's when you're gonna have a little bit of a problem. Score. It's actually pretty good. Nice. All right, cool. So we're getting up to the top of the hour, dudes. Um, do you want to work on this stuff after Space News, or do you want to save it for tomorrow so we can do after hours? I think we should. I think we should save it tomorrow for after hours. Or not to. I combined three options there. I think we should save it for tomorrow because this is, yeah, we're going to have to go through the pipeline again. That's okay. What we're doing here in modeling, guys, is basically called a detail pass. I decided to do a detail pass in the model because now would be the time to change it because you don't want to finish the damn texture and then look at the model and say that sucks. We should add more to the model and then have to re-UV, have to retexture. It's, it's better to do it now. Um, but that's that's good, man. That shows that I'm relearning how to do all this stuff, which is good. And this, this is only going to get better and better. Bember. Guys, I'll be honest with you. Here's the exact reason why, um, here's the exact reason why I wanted to get back into doing this. Uh, okay, we'll just save that. Um, let me dump out a Kerbal. And Unity, I have to open up so many damn programs. Uh, don't save anything there. All right, so the, the reason why I'm really looking into this and the reason why I want to reteach myself and the reason why I picked the hinge part because the hinge part is basically as simple of a KSP part as you can get. It's a structural piece. It has no extra attributes. It's not a rocket engine with where you have to tell it where to apply thrust, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I'm looking to do is see how quickly we can um, bring an asset into KSP. This is kind of teaching me how to do it right and how to get back into it and how to optimize a workflow the reason why is because if i if i start a mission mode save what i would like to do is make my own parts if we need them if we if we need them and it mostly would be gse right ground service equipment so like i'm talking like a modular launch pad parts pack where you could uh take pieces of fixed service structures stack them on top of each other you could use that to make a mobile launcher or you could use it to make whatever and then you know if we use the mod like this in conjunction with kerbal constructs you could make a launch pad for whatever and it would be really easy you know so um yeah uh it's better with this first part as simple as it is to do it right so later when we go to if we go to make a more complicated part i know the perfect way of doing it right and then we can have that you know just saying Yeah, we got to figure out the perfect way to do it. And then we'll figure out the uh, good way to do it when we go to make parts in KSP for mission mode. Guys, can you imagine here? What I was thinking, let's go down here like this. Get rid of that. I have Space News links compiled, and I'll, I'll get more of them in a second. Let me move the tab out of the way. Put that over there. There's a picture from between the Apollo program and between the shuttle program, right? Where NASA, this is from, this picture's from the late 70s. This is where NASA is taking pieces off of the Apollo, the Saturn V mobile launchers, and they're reusing those pieces to make a shuttle fixed service structure. Talking about a part pack where you could do this. Right? You'd have a part, a modular piece that's just basically this. 
right? Like one segment of this, like the tower segments that SpaceX has. And then you could stack them in the SPH or move them around or do whatever. I mean, you, maybe we make it so you could attach a docking port and then each part will slot into the other and the docking port will hold it together like how we actually make fixed service structures in KSP without the... There's already a mod for that. Yeah, I don't really care that there's already a mod for that. I'll make my own. Thank you very much. Yeah, modular launch pads. You can make MLs and stuff. So Genesis, the idea that I was just thinking, like... You know, with NASA moving the fixed service structure, right? They just disassembled an LUT and they just started stacking it over here on the side, right? With a crane, right? That's what they, that they just, you know, I'm talking about being able to do that in Kerbal. Like if you want to reconfigure a pad while it's out there, you could, or in our particular case, you just go into the SPH and start stacking pieces on top of each other in the SPH, like you'd stack fuel tanks, right? Same idea. Like we could make the staircases on these things glidable so a Kerbal could like walk up the pad or something and then get to like a, you could make a, like a crew access arm attachment piece and just, you know, so you could have your Kerbals walk into your rocket and stuff, which would be really cool. It would be interesting to see how you deal with part drift and joint strength, same vessel collision, same thing that we're doing with the hinge, dude. How do you think they do it? Seriously, look, how do you think, here, um, Let's just go to NSF and look at the latest video of them stacking tower segments. You know, uh, obviously it's not the exact same, but we'll watch this video more in depth kind of later. Well, I mean, yeah, here you could use this. You could use this as an example too, right? They're going to guide it into place and then there's a guide. For, and of course, they cut the camera. There's a there's guide pieces and you you slide slot piece each piece in together. That's how this stuff is done. In real life, that's how they do it. They they make like a pilot dowel. I'm not sure what the name would be in construction, but those are engines. That's the decanter. So like stacking the tower pieces. Oh hello. See the tower pieces have little guides up there see the little tabs on the very top so when they go to stack the next piece it kind of aligns if hell hydra if i model something like that right and then we click same vessel interaction on every time you time warp or every time you time warp every time you reload every time you re-simulate physics like when dock undock this thing will just it'll it might drift a little bit for a second but same vessel collision will just snap it right back together and then if we go Kerbal Engineer and strut this stuff together on top of that, right? We have a Kerbal like walk up the staircase that we make and then use Kerbal Engineer and strut things, right? Then you're really good to go. Then that thing's never coming apart, dude. You just crack and proof, crack and strike proof. gonna need a bigger crane heck we mutter we can make a crane parts pack so you can make cranes in ksp if you really want to i think we'll start with equipment first you saying you want to just model tower sections and you build a crane and manually put it together shah here's the thing if i build it the right way you could do that sure or you could just snap it together in the sph why choose because you don't know the can of worms you opened here i don't think you understand the can of I don't think you understand the, the can of worms that was opened up when you said, yeah, make mod parts for Kerbal. 
I'm all about trying to make parts that we need for mission mode that kind of seamlessly integrate with my mission mode rules. That's that's what I want to do. The idea is that if someone wants to play by this rule set, they download my parts pack and boom, you can you could build the exact same stuff. Now, the thing is, is that I really only want to build parts that are for GSE. I still want my vehicles to remain stock. Yeah, stock looking. Yeah, I, I think that would be cooler. Imagine having like Condor 9 with its pad and everything or MLV or something with its pad and it's good to go. Like, you know, you have a launch pad that looks like Kerbal Parts. Like, dude, even make, like if I make a mobile launcher, just lift the panel texture and just make it look like a bunch of panels that are put together, right? Make it look like it belongs. So it still maintains that stock feel. The vehicles are still stock, but we don't have oppressively bad frame rates right we could build stuff quickly and launching it isn't you're not going to do it at two frames a second you know two words functional cables worms these are snakes yeah this hinge is only the beginning yeah we could make a tower segment mod where you just build a catch tower if you really want to or fixed service structure or mobile launcher or launch umbilical tower Heck, even make the MLs. Make the ML modular. Here, look. The MLs can be taken apart. They can be reconfigured. Like, make a parts pack that's these pieces, right? That's a ML, right? And you could replace the center piece depending on what kind of rocket you want. Like, and then you make parts that are just that that's the scaffolding and stuff. See that we could make the uh, ML pegs right there. You can make a part that does that, that it, that seamlessly integrates with Kerbal constructs. Think about it, dudes. You make this part right here. You make that a thing in Kerbal constructs. So you put out a pad that just has the pegs on it. Right for in Kerbal constructs. Then you take this thing. And you could, if you could somehow drive it over, use landing gear to lift it up, and then use landing gear to set it down. Now you have a pad that's fixed to the freaking ground that's never moving. Just saying, good work. I don't know if I could make a crawler. I could make a crawler parts pack, guys, but I would need I would need help coding the track mechanism, guys. <laughs> yeah, the track mechanism would be difficult, but we could do that, sure. You can make a crawler transporter pack. I could even make it so you could make different size crawlers if we really do it right. Like, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to overpromise. Uh, let's just get the hinge going. But if I find a way to quickly do this, we can make whatever. You never know. Make whatever you want. The implementation shouldn't be too hard, but like with a crawler, I'd have to go look into the documentation for making rover wheels in Kerbal. That shouldn't be too hard, I guess. And it's just gonna take time, that's all. Yeah, exactly, Seacracken. You'd have to be careful, but you have to be careful with the real stuff too. 12 meter by 12 meter plate. Yeah. Would it be possible to build welded docking ports, like tiny ports that work like docking ports, but are super strong and perma-weld? I don't, I don't really see why not, right? That mod exists already. Mm -hmm. I need like a structural attachment docking port. So a docking port that's just, that uses the docking port scripts and you can kind of put two parts together, right? And then once those two attach, right, they part weld themselves to each other. <sighs> Not sure how we do that. Make a ground anchor that isn't bad. Well, Kerbal Constructs would be the way to do that, Sea Kraken. Yeah. Can you imagine us rolling a crawler transporter? Right? And then the Kerbals can walk around on the catwalks and stuff. We could do that, man. 
if you guys want to see stuff like that, let me know. Okay. I can do it. I could do that. I mean, for right now, we're going to continue with our hinge. But if you want to see stuff like that, shoot me a message. Say, EJ, I want to see this. Stuff like that. That's what Rover Dudes weld the docking ports do. It really very much seems like we are following in Rover Dudes' footsteps here. All right. Yeah. Yeah, we're very much following in his footsteps. Anyway. <laughs> Guys, uh, let me just go run down and check on uh, Bree and the dog. Go say hi. And uh, yeah, I will be back for Space News. We'll begin Space News probably 10 minutes, something like that. I'll be back momentarily. Get ready for the Space News.